So we're taking a look uh, at Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. And we want to look at what the stories were really about. Rick Warren had one idea, but what was the real purpose of Jesus' stories? Was it primarily to explain his audience, entertain his audience, so as to build a crowd from which he might draw converts? That's what Rick Warren thinks. But interestingly, the disciples asked Jesus why he taught using parables in Matthew 13.10. But Jesus' answer is not what the seeker-sensitive model might lead one to expect. Any hint of entertainment is nowhere to be found in his response. Rather, his motive for using, Jesus' motive for using stories was so that the spiritual truth might be hidden from those to whom God had not chosen to reveal it. Interesting. In fact, Mark 4.34 notes that Christ had to explain the stories he told to his disciples in private so that they could fulfill, fully understand them. Understand this, that Jesus presented and was willing to explain anything as he came, came to him to know of him and who he was and what his stories meant. So uh, this was a moment when one who was chosen uh, to understand who Jesus is will go to him to find out more. Very few did. In fact, Mark 4.34 notes that Christ had to explain the stories he told to his disciples in private because they did ask him so that they could fully understand them. Matthew 13.35 adds a second reason Jesus spoke in parables to fulfill prophecy. Uh, that would be notable. Interesting thing, have you ever done that? Where somebody is wasting your time, nitpicking, maybe even uh, disguising an attack upon your personality. So you give them an answer that is correct one, but it's hidden. The answer is hidden. It's a little bit mystical, perhaps. Uh, a little bit evasive. And the person, if they really wanted to know what you were talking about, to entertain whether or not what you had to say was of value, you say, well, what do you mean by that? I find I do this all, a lot. Uh, and they don't answer. I just had a telephone conversation with a, a Jehovah Witness, and she said she wanted to talk to me. I said, well, let's talk about one thing at a time. How about John 1.1? 1, 1? And I continued to talk, and she continued to evade my answers and go elsewhere. I said, we need to stop and stay at one thing at a time and move on to the next. I was purposely giving her answers, like, in the beginning, what's the word? In the beginning of all time of creation, the word was already there. Who was that word? And she mentioned Jesus Christ. Well, doesn't that make him God? See, now, see, what do you mean by that? I'm trying to explain. But she wants to go elsewhere. Oh, let's discuss something else. No, the interesting thing about the Bible is we take one thing at a time and build, just like a house. You build the foundation first. You don't start building the roof until you're finished with the foundation and everything goes in between the roof and the foundation. And so she hung up on me. Yet scripture never indicates that the purpose behind his stories was founded in entertainment or in an attempt to please the crowd. For that matter, in John 6, when Christ had just attracted a large crowd, he rebuked them because they only followed him for the novelty of a supernatural free lunch. That's verses 26 to 27. Matter of fact, 28 to 29 says, they said, okay, one of the works that a man must do to gain eternal life. See, Jesus said, do the works that one must do to have eternal life. Well, then they turn around and say, well, what does that mean? And Jesus said, the work uh, of, is this, that you believe in the one God has sent. That's another uh, confusing statement. Well, they would say, well, who is the one that God has sent? And Jesus would have said, the one standing before you. And he continued to say, I'm the bread of life. Little statements. They didn't like that. Uh, so he gave them a statement that was really difficult. Unless you drink my blood, uh, blood and drink, eat my flesh, you have no part in me. What does that mean? The disciples asked him in private. But Jesus said my words were spiritual, figurative. He would already explained to them, you believe in him, and he will provide eternal life for you through sacrifice for your sins. He's already implied that, stipulated that a number of times before he got to that, and they just, they all left him. They weren't really willing to find out what he was and who he was, what it was about. 
So moreover, Jesus' non-seeker-friendly message ended up driving the crowd away. Like Christ, entertainment was also not the primary goal of the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians 1.17, he told the church at Corinth, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross would not be made void. Second Corinthians 12, 1-5 echoes the same. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming you to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. And that's amazing. Sometimes I worry I haven't done a good enough job doing these YouTubes and doing my website. I find lots of errors I'd like to fix and, and move on and clarify. But you know what? i got to go on and move on to the next thing that God provides homework for to move on to the next stage. God the Holy Spirit will clarify it for you through the power of God. While there are many who wanted to, their ears tickled, 2 Timothy 4.3, Paul's concern was not on eloquence, but rather faithfulness. This is not to say that good communication skills are not valuable, but rather to say that they are a distant second when compared to the integrity of the message. The audience, not the message, is sovereign. Both Warren and Hybels are, of course, quick to assure their readers that despite their focus on left felt needs, the message itself remains intact. In practice, however, these claims do not accurately reflect reality. By concentrating on felt needs, you feel you have a need for something, the message is necessarily changed because its focus has changed. It's not what you need, it's what God is telling you. The evidence from God's Word clearly gives a negative answer to these questions. Obviously, the answer is taken into account. Consider Paul and Mars Hill in Acts 17. Yet the felt needs of the audience are never given first place. Rather, faithfulness to the message and to the giver of that message is always what is important. Thus, Paul tells Timothy that while people will one day exchange sound doctrine for entertainment, accumulating for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, we see that today, Timothy is to preach the word without compromise. <clears throat> Likewise, Titus is to rebuke the lazy and gluttonous Cretans who were clearly ruled by their felt needs, reproving them with right doctrine that may, they might be sound in the faith. More directly, Paul makes it clear that in these his evangelistic endeavors, his goal was not to please men, but rather to please God. After all, he received a message and his commission from Christ himself. Paul's focus, therefore, was on serving his Lord and bringing him glory. Christ was his highest priority. When it came to evangelism, Paul and the other apostles, Peter and so on in Acts 2 and 4, concentrated on meeting the real needs of their audience, namely the sinner's need for salvation, rather than focusing on their superficial felt needs. Well... But is the purpose of the church as it meets in its weekly assembly to evangelize the lost? Or is it rather to edify the saints? Hebrews 10.25 So that they might be better equipped to witness as they go through their life context. Right? How many people come to church to be saved? No, we get trained to give the gospel to people outside of the church. A far greater expanse of witnessing than just people that have come to a, a building. Christians are to meet and engage people where they are, out in the world, and not wait for them to come to a church meeting. Exactly what I just said. The apostles' teaching was designed to nourish the faith of new believers, and those who were continuously devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. And they were also those who had previously received Peter's word unto salvation and were baptized. All who believed were baptized and added to the fellowship of believers, also welcomed the apostles' teaching. In other words, all the believers were continually coming to the apostle, the apostles, to be instructed in God's truth. These first gatherings of the church were designed primarily for edifying believers, not for evangelizing unbelievers. Of course, they were reaching out to the unsaved, for the Lord is adding to their number every day, day by day, for those who are being saved. But 
This evangelism explosion was the result of their teaching, not the stated purpose of it. They gathered for, ed for edification. They scattered for evangelism. The primary focus of their corporate worship gatherings was for building up the believers, not for reaching seekers. When this priority becomes reversed and the church meets primarily to save the lost, the apostles' teaching soon becomes compromised and diluted. That's a lot of times you go to a church and you're you're fully aware of the gospel so many times have we repeated it and shared it, and yet the, the church keeps thinking that unbelievers come to the church and they give them the basic gospel and no further uh, instruction in growing in the faith. So the biblical data then emphasizes body life within the church as believers exercise their spiritual gifts in the local church context. The evidence does not encourage or even apply that weekly church services should be primarily evangelistic. That's why I didn't like going to churches where at the end of the church, they always gave the gospel as if that was the whole purpose. Moreover, the New Testament even mentioned, it mentions the importance of music in the church with possible exceptions, uh, Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. Once again, seeker-sensitive leaders like Highbells and Warren are primarily basing their methodology on what attracts unbelievers, not on which that which is inherently biblical. So, let us move back to Rick Warren after that. A chance to serve. Last week I met a lady at a senior center event with, when, and she recommended me to Pastor J. Philip Miller Evans for a youth pastor assistant at a local American Baptist church. I have an interview Thursday next week. There's a small income involved, which will be needed as my hours on my part-time job will be reduced in July. Looking forward to uh, retirement, but I still need to eat. Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> the basic observation exegesis of Romans chapter 6 that I've done is finished and ready to examine for all who are interested in it. Most commentaries, we'll look at that in a second, I have seen do not deal with this chapter in detail, verse by verse, point for point. Hence I saw the need to do just that, to affirm that salvation is by faith alone, that does not demand demonstration in one's faith and life thereafter in order to confirm that salvation is secured. Furthermore, Paul clearly teaches that the Christian life is a struggle between offering the parts of one's body to sin or to righteousness moment to moment in view of the believer's position of enslavement enslavement to the righteous sovereignty of God. <clears throat> take a look, let's take a look at that. Okay. Romans chapter 6. The purpose of the observation stage is to maintain focus on the text at hand within the norm of the rules of language, context, and logic. Guess what we learned? That we learned that in grammar school. What have we done since then? You add to the skill set by reading more and more difficult things like newspapers and magazines and textbooks and uh, uh, business contracts, all kinds of things. But it's still the same language, context, and logic. How do you find the meaning of words in the Bible? In the dictionary. I was told the other day that Noah Webster was a Christian. Well, or Funkin Wagnall or any of the other dictionaries that reflect how words are used in this century and past centuries. You look at King James Version, you can't look at modern English dictionaries, can you? King James is 16th century, 1611, and thereafter. So when you look at a book, a word of the King James Version, you better have Elizabeth and English dictionary there. There are many uses for words that we hear and understand in English, but they have an older understanding when the Bible, uh, the King James Bible translation was made. So, let's look at chapter 6 of Romans. What shall we say then? We believers. Let me just fix it here. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Interesting. We believers, 
Shall we go in sitting? It sounds uh, that you have the...